We are witnessing a long and violent end to the First World War in Europe and in the Middle East with occupying regimes. This is the case of Istanbul, the only capital to be occupied. The occupation of Istanbul was a trauma after the Mudros Armistice of 30 October 1918. No other capital city of defeated powers was occupied. The occupation of Berlin, the capital of Germany, had been considered <coughs> by George Clemenceau, French Prime Minister, but the idea was not retained. Neither Berlin, nor Vienna, nor Budapest, nor Sofia were occupied. Only Istanbul was occupied by the military. It seems that the occupation of Istanbul is linked to the Eastern question, the question d'Orient. Our presentation will be organized around four main points. First, on the regime of military occupation. Second, about the arrival of the Allied forces. Then, uh, about the ambiguous status of this non-official uh, um, forces in Istanbul, and then about uh, uh, the last part of the occupation that uh, was official. First, a few words about the regime of military occupation. Military occupation regimes underwent a very important evolution during the 19th century. Initially, military occupation regimes guaranteed the victor revenge on the defeated. After the conflict, the purpose of military occupation was to guarantee security um, during the 19th century on the European territory, and military occupation forces were a form of guarantee. After the Congress of uh, Vienna in 1815, the objective of military occupation was to neutralize a power considered as a potential danger by imposing the status of vanquished. This was the case for France after the Napoleonic Wars between 1814 and 1818, and also after the Franco-Prussian War between 1870 and 1873. For example, the Ottoman principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia were occupied by the Russian army from 1828 onwards in order to force the Ottoman Empire to respect the commitments of the Treaty of London of 1827 vis-a-vis -vis Greece. Russia exercised a military occupation as well as a political and cultural influence. A military occupation is also seen as a temporary measure. It is an intermediate or transitional period. The occupied country is responsible for the maintenance of the occupying forces. This is in addition to the payment of war operations. Also, the occupation during the wars, in wartime, military occupation increased the power of the occupier. There is also a distinction between a military occupation and a form of annexation. In the 19th century, military occupation followed customary rules. Then in 1907, the Hague Convention imposed on the army of occupation a mission to maintain order in accordance with the laws of the occupied country. Thus, the security of the occupation troops must be ensured by the state whose territory is occupied. The regimes of military occupation during wars are characterized by military control and also often by military administration. Um, most of the time happens excesses like violence on civilian populations and even regimes of terror. Civilian populations are recognized to participate in the war effort of the occupier. After the First World War, the military occupation 
at the mission of enforcing and applying the peace treaties. After the First World War, what is new is that the military command is subordinated, pardon, subordinated to a civilian administration called the High Interallied Commission. This was the case in Germany with the High Interallied Commission of the Rhine territories, which was to disappear within 15 years if Germany respected its commitment. Indeed, an early evacuation took place in 1930. In Istanbul, a interallied commission was also held. These high interallied commissions had to recognize the sovereignty of the occupied states. However, they had the power to issue orders in the field of police and justice. They also had the right of requisition. This new form of domination in which the civilian authorities oversaw the military command could be compared to a form of peaceful penetration uh, in first a term used, uh, for example, for the uh, French um, political and military uh, uh, tools in, uh, in Morocco a few uh, years before the First World War, like a peaceful penetration of the occupied territories. Indeed, their presence goes far beyond a military occupation. It's, it is both a military and a civilian occupation. This is a case in Istanbul. The occupation of the Allied forces deploys military actions, but also civilian ones, in particular by taking charge of the humanitarian issue of refugees with the influx of more than a million of uh, Russian refugees. For example, the Gallipoli Peninsula was organized to temporarily accommodate Russian refugees. The terms of the armistice provided that the whole part of the Ottoman territory could also eventually be occupied. The occupation of Istanbul took place in several stages. <coughs> The first days began in, on uh, 13 November 1918 with the occupation of Istanbul. Then we already spoke about this on 8 February 1919. It was officially invested with the triumphant entry of the French General Franchet d'Espere, who was the commander in chief of the Allied armies in Salonika. And after, the, after 16 March 1920, the occupation was reinforced by military measure, but also a state of, uh, of uh, siege. All this picture was uh, were taken by uh, the French military uh, photographic uh, section. The second point is the arrival of the Allied forces on 12 November 1918, the Allied fleet entered the Dardanelles where it had been held in check three years earlier in 1915. The first to enter the Straits was the British, led by the Admiral Carthorpe, who later became the British High Commissioner for the capital city, Istanbul. Then followed the French, the Italian, and Greek naval squadrons. In all, there were about 50 warships, 27 British, 13 French, six Italian, and four Greek. They entered the Sea of Marmara and headed for Istanbul, the capital of the Ottoman Empire, and arrived in Istanbul on 13 November 1918, settling in the capital. The general mind, the British Salonika Force Commander, moved his forces to Istanbul on 18 December 1918, and his units were renamed the Army of the Black Sea. At first, their presence was that of a maritime presence of the Allied forces, this practice was common since the 19th century with a role of uh, protection and also of uh, deterrence. Then the situation, the situation changed with the landing of British, French, and Italian troops who settled in the capital. 
Moreover, tension arose also within the command of the Allied forces in Istanbul, and it was due to the rivalry between the French general Franchet d'Esperey, the commander of, uh, in chief of the Army of the East, um, of the Army d'Orient, and the British general Mine, who was detached from the Army of the East and also the Army d'Orient, and was the commander of the Allied troops in the Black Sea and Trost Caucasia. Then, on 8 February 1919, arrived General Franchet d'Esperey, the French commander of the French army. We already spoke on, uh, on him, and I was very happy that uh, we have seen this small uh, film uh, um, on, uh, about his arrival. His triumphal and theatric theatrical arrival has symbolic importance and makes a great effect. 21 cannon shots were fired. General Franchet d'Esperey announced to the journalists that he will be lodged at the Dolma Pache Dolma <coughs> Palace and was also acclaimed, for example, by the Greeks of uh, um, Istanbul. We can see him in, uh, in, in the middle. The occupation troops were numerous, with a, a total of more than 100,000 men. And in Paris, there was a, a British uh, division in Istanbul, a French division, and uh, uh, Italian and Greek uh, detachment. And the Italian were also in uh, the, the Asian part of um, Istanbul. Is there a legal basis for this military presence? In fact, it seems that it's a de facto occupation that was put in place from 18, from 13 November 1918. Uh, it seems also that this military occupation was initially non-official or unofficial, and that uh, the occupation was based on an extensive interpretation of uh, the regime of the Straits. Then it seems that the status of uh, the Allied forces in, in Istanbul is uh, at least uh, ambiguous. It's, it's like unofficial, non-official. And we can ask the question, why this military occupation of Istanbul, the capital of an empire? And the summary level, it marks that the Ottoman Empire is treated as a defeated power in a classical way, this military occupation aims at enforcing the provisions of the armistice, notably the, demob the, the demobilization of the troops, as well as their surrender. In reality, the ceasefire was not respected throughout the territory, and these facts were used and instrumentalized by the Allies uh, to legitimize the occupation of Istanbul. You can see, for example, here Ottoman and German artillery pieces uh, that were confiscated by the Allies. The high commissions were headed by senior civilian and military officials who also, at the same time, performed diplomatic function. Indeed, uh, they, they were acting as intermediary between their own government and the government of the Ottoman Empire. By 1919, the Allied military occupation of Istanbul was organized with British, French, Italian, and also American, Greek, and Japanese high commissioners. The British president was responsible for civil police, passport control in Allied tribunals, court martial in 1920, and also prisons. There were, uh, in fact, many prisons in Istanbul. The French prison was in Kulkapı. The British prison were in, in the Galata Tower, the Arab Han, the Hotel Croker, and the Shahin Pasha Hotel. However, the attribution of uh, the various high commissioners were different and uh, they were different from one country to, to another. 
For example, the French High Commissioner had a wider margin of maneuver in addition to ensuring the application of the clauses of the armistice and the French interest, he had also uh, a reformist agenda with a view to guaranteeing the repayment of the Ottoman debt because most of the debt was held by French, by French people. On 13 November 1918, an American High Commissioner, Consul Lewis Heck, was sent to the Ottoman capital, to Istanbul. The British High Commission was housed in the British Embassy in, um, in Peran. And until the autumn, autumn of 1920, it was like a sort of a naval mission. Uh, then uh, there was a, a change in July 1919. Karl Thorpe was promoted to general and he was replaced by the vice admiral John de Robeck, who was also the commander in chief of the Allied fleet in the Mediterranean. As for the French, the French High Commission was headed by uh, vice admiral Jean Amet, commander of the naval forces in the Dardanelles. <clears throat> and in January 1919, this post was given to a diplomat, uh, Mr. Albert de France. As for the Italian, the Italian High Commissioner was Carlos Forza, and he was also replaced in 19, June 1919 by Felice Maissa. This occupation of the capital city, Istanbul, was manifested by the occupation of its various infrastructure, structures, but occupation of the stations, the ports, um, the means of transport, the warehouses, and etc. Uh, on the legal level, on the legal level, a court of martial law, Divani Arbi Office, was established in Istanbul in December 1918, and this military occupation modified the appearance and the functioning of the capital city by promoting a control over all the activities and also uh, on the, um, the movement of the people. They also could organize uh, requisition on the local population. This military presence imposed itself on the view with the, the arrival of thousands of foreign soldiers who are also to be taken care of. Uh, we can also speak a little bit of a uh, kind of militarization of the public space of uh, the capital city. The accommodation of uh, these foreign soldiers is organized in camps in the periphery uh, of the city, but not only uh, uh, in the periphery, Soldiers were also held in barracks in Bayolu or in schools, in hospitals, in hotels. For example, in Kuluceshme, the Konak of Enver Pasha was requisitioned and transformed by General Francia Despere into a headquarters. And it was, of course, uh, very symbolic to uh, requisition the, um, the Konak uh, of uh, the former. Um, Minister of War. The inter allied government in Istanbul had uh, many attributions, and uh, the attribution of the High Commissioner were expanded and were also uh, equivalent in some way of like a, um, a super government on uh, uh, the capital city. In fact, um, this inter-allied government had like a sort of tutelage over the Ottoman government as far as uh, uh, the administration of the capital was concerned. It had many specialized inter-allied commissions. First of all, from uh, 1918 to 1919, the number of uh, the commission became more important and uh, the first interim meeting was at very, very, very soon. It was on 28 November 1918 at the French Embassy. And the meeting uh, were every week. Uh, it was on uh, the Friday afternoons. And also many experts 
participated in um, in this um, in this meeting and in the preparation of the meeting. It was a, an organization that was uh, at first uh, viewed as provi pro provisional until the signing of the peace treaty, and after the signing of the Treaty of Self in August 1920, the commissions became permanent and had a uh, legal framework. That means that the allies interfered with the uh, administration of the city and that they were controlling uh, uh, in many ways the city and uh, that they had also uh, <clears throat> um, the objective of uh, preventing disorder in the city. On, on, 10, on 10, 10 January 1919, General Mind received the order to take the control of the police in Istanbul and the inter-allied police was formed by three representatives, one British, one French, and one Italian, and its president, its president was British. They also managed a control um, on the information. Uh, it was set up in Istanbul with a censorship uh, to control the inter-allied press. Um, then it's like a, a sort of interrelated censorship service. The control of the French press in, press in Istanbul was characterized by the diffusion of articles from the news bulletins of the Grand Headquarters, the Grand Quartier General, and the high commissioners, they ruled like uh, in cooperation, but at the same time, there, were, there was a hierarchy among, um, among them. Thus, in addition to the occupying forces, the city welcomed also many new ar arrivals, uh, such as uh, the refugee and also the, uh, the prisoner of war. The creation of new theaters, cabarets, or music halls in Istanbul meets the demand for entertainment for the occupation forces, and we see in particular the blossoming of cinemas. We have also had a, a paper, a very interesting paper on, the, on, this, uh, subject, on this subject, because cinema was a very important vector of propaganda at that time. And in Istanbul, there were, as we've seen, many cinemas, and uh, some of them had also a very large capacity, and that's, that's also very uh, interesting and important. For example, we see here um, a photo, a uh, picture of uh, shopkeepers who, rem who remove a um, uh, sign written uh, in German to rewrite them in uh, in uh, in French, and uh, it's also uh, a new um, a new appearance of uh, the city erasing all the um, uh, former uh, German um, uh, presence. At that time, uh, the, the military uh, um, was uh, um, using uh, the cinema photographs and, uh, uh, and to, to organize a, a, a propaganda campaign. And we can speak uh, on real propaganda campaign or persuaded by the photographic and cinematographic services of um, uh, the army. The projection of propaganda films had already begun during the First World War, and after the First World War, film propaganda developed in the occupied region, in the East, in the Balkans, and also in Germany, in the Ruhr area from uh, 1923 on. After the arrival of the Allied forces in Istanbul, important means of propaganda were developed to reach the local population. For example, France sought to export propaganda films to be shown in the cinemas of Istanbul, where Italian films were mainly shown and uh, uh, were very uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, popular at that time. As early as 1918, the army film section, the section, section uh, cinematographic de l'armée, made films in Istanbul 
the most famous example is the, the film Constantinople that you, are, you have shown, glorifying the arrival of General Franchet Despere in Istanbul. It is a real staging and dramatization when he, uh, he lands on the case of Galata. The French ships are honored with uh, white shirts. This glorious staging of French military equipment seeks to suggest to the viewer a conquering vision of French. And uh, <clears throat> this staging of uh, General Franchet Despere, accompanied by Admiral Amé, shows him being welcomed by a British delegation and the governor of Istanbul, and is the background as the city of Istanbul and the ships uh, scenic uh, in the conquest of Istanbul by France. Uh, <clears throat> the color of the horse of uh, General uh, <laughs> Franchet Despere uh, has been a very important topic, and the repre representation of this color has been the subject of much discussion. Most of the time, the white color of his horse is evoked, while the iconography uh, denies it. It participates also in the construction of uh, a myth. The adjective ak refers to a symbol without perhaps really designating a color. General Franchet Despere, who had been appointed commander in chief of the Entente Army, went to the French embassy with great pomp. He was flanked by two, uh, uh, two poilus, two uh, helmeted soldiers who hold the reign of his horse. He salutes uh, in the style of Roman proconsul and makes his entrance into a conquered city. This entry of the general, Franchet Despere, on 8 February 1919, takes place after the city had been occupied for almost three months. But he made his entry as a commander in chief of, um, of the Allied armies. You can see again. The arrival of the French soldier was highly publicized by the operators of the Photographic and Cinematographic Society of the Army, the Société Photographique et Cinématographique de l'Armée. In this photographic corpus, we see the reception of General Franchet Despere at the French uh, Embassy. You can see here. Now it's a residence of the French Consul in Rudia Sokak, and it's a French Research Institute here. <laughs> but also, um, this military uh, uh, photographic and cinematographic uh, society um, takes a, a lot of pictures in, in, in a little bit exotic uh, uh, style picture of, uh, uh, of the city, picture of a commercial uh, uh, district and a real photographic campaign is carried out which diffuses propaganda photos in the press enhancing the image uh, of France. The press information office provided the Ministry of Foreign Affairs through the intermediary of the photographic section of the army, the section photographic de l'armée since April 1915 with propaganda photos to be published in the foreign press. In the first quarter of 1919, a French propaganda house was set up in the Grand Rue de Pera. This house centralized the French propaganda, and it was also the place where exhibitions were held in this hall, exhibition of paintings, of photos, postcards, books, brochures, and this establishment diffu diffused also all this element of propaganda of France to uh, the provinces um, uh, in Turkey. In addition to cinematographic, cinematographic projection of propaganda, there were also military concerts of music uh, that were given uh, in Istanbul. This, this were these various pictures of, uh, um, for example, of um, of people and different uh, quarters. And there were many pictures of, uh, of, uh, of Galata, for example. Here it was a picture of uh, a soldier selling bread. Um, picture of uh, barbers. Mm. 
The French propaganda mission was also supported by the services of the French Gendarmerie in Istanbul. Indeed, in 1919, Colonel Poulon, the, uh, he was inspector of the Ottoman Gendarmerie, proposed the intervention of the Gendarmerie to contribute to the propaganda effort. For example, the French Gendarmes distributed postcards and photos to the local population. This moral support is supported by the Cine Photo Section, a cinematographic organ intended to diffuse French propaganda in the East. And uh, this section was attached to the information section of the Ministry of War and also to the Ministry of Fine Arts and um, began in October 1915 in Salonika. Uh, it's interesting also to to make a comparison with uh, the excavation. It was at the same time and uh, all this uh, business began uh, uh, during uh, the Salonika campaign. The film and photo section was set up in Istanbul in October 1917 and 20 stations of film projection equipment were sent from Paris to organize the projection of the films in Istanbul. French propaganda elements circulated between the French metropolis as well as other French posts uh, abroad uh, with sending propaganda films, propaganda newspaper, post postcards. And this means that many French propaganda film, films that were filmed in Istanbul, for example, were shown in many countries giving them a great visibility and great information also uh, about Istanbul and, and situation of uh, uh, its occupied city. Then the, the official occupation of Istanbul began uh, on March 1920 uh, with uh, uh, the decision of uh, um, the reoccupation of um, Istanbul, the French general François Desperé was removed in early uh, 1921, and then the general Charles Harrington was assigned as commander in chief of the Allied forces of the occupation in Istanbul until uh, the Allied evacuation in October 1923. And in 1922, the government of Ankara began to press for an end to this military occupation. And slowly, the prospect of the Allies' withdrawal from Istanbul caused a wave of exile. And the uh, most famous example is uh, uh, that uh, Sultan Mehmet VI himself left, left the capital on uh, 17 November 1922. On 25 August 1923, an agreement was reached between the French General Sharpie, you can see him here on, uh, on the picture, and the British General Arrington with Selahattin Adil Pasha in the name of the government of Ankara to apply the clause of the Treaty of Lausanne, which provided for the transfer of Istanbul to the Turkish authorities. Then began uh, the evacuation uh, uh, of Istanbul. On 2, on 2 October 1923, the foreign occupation troops left Istanbul, and a few days uh, later, on 6 October 1923, the Turkish army took possession of the city of Istanbul. So, indeed, the only military occupation of a capital city in Istanbul, which lasted almost five years after the First World War. Thank you very much.